Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Weekly Update. It's the 11th of October. Nice selection of updates this week. It's been a very SQL Server themed week in terms of new videos. I dived into what exactly is Azure SQL Hyperscale. And one of the big things I try and convey here is I hate the name. And you can see that I've got a bunch of different possible names. Because when I think of hyperscale, I think of it's only if I have really large scale, really high performance type databases, which is really not the case at all. It's capable of really high scale, really high performance databases. But the reality is I really recommend going and checking this out because for most SQL workloads, it's actually probably the right option and the most cost um, optimized version as well. And I looked into the new Azure SQL database free offer. So every subscription, one database per sub, you get a certain bucket of Azure SQL serverless uh, v core seconds. So it's really good for sort of dev test, playing around and learning. So on to what's new on the compute side. So for my app service environments, that's remember where it's all dedicated to my particular instance. There's no shared infrastructure like regular app service plans. They now have a memory intensive pricing tier. Remember different workloads have different requirements. Some are more CPU focused, some are more memory focused, some are more just general mix. So now what you have this ability to do is pick this memory intensive type SKU. So you can see all these different pricing tiers and now you have this memory intensive tier. You can see kind of where it's available, all the different kind of regions and things. Uh, not in GovCloud quite yet. But the whole point here with this SKU is, as the name suggests, it's more memory focused in terms of the ratio. So it can go from two virtual cores with 16 gigabytes of RAM for the L1 MV2, all the way up to 32 virtual cores with 256 gigabytes of RAM. So you can go and look at those and maybe that's a better option for your workload. On the networking side, so the App Gateway V2 Basic SKU has gone GA. So this is really aimed at those small, medium sized customers. It doesn't have advanced auto scale or traffic management, but it does have built in high availability. It's the same kind of HTTP2, HTTP, HTTPS, WebSockets, a whole bunch of core features you can see down here all the way from my basic SKU it has a slightly lower SLA compared to the standard SKU, but it doesn't have the advanced features like URL rewrite, mutual TLS, private link support. Obviously it has lower scale. You can see that down here, but based on your requirements, it may be a better cost optimized version um, for you to use. So you now can go and check that out and make that choice. Bring your own IP now has this global regional configuration that has gone GA. So ordinarily, when we have a public IP, it's from Azure's IP ranges. We don't need to bring public IP routable IPs. But let's say I'm an organization that does have a very large amount of public IPs. And maybe I have a certain service that has built up a certain reputation with other services or they're configured to use the IP instead of a DNS. And I want to move that service to Azure. I don't want to have to re-establish trust in IP ranges that belong to Azure. So I can bring my own IPs that I already own that are publicly routable and take a set of those, a certain prefix size, and put them in Azure. So what I can now do is I can bring a certain set to add it to that globally advertised space from Azure that can be as small as a slash 24 up to a slash 21. And then I break that up into child prefixes, which belong to certain regions. And that can be as small as a slash 26. And then once it's part of a region, well, then I can go and use it with certain Azure resources that use public IPs. That is available for both um, Azure Public and US Gov. The Azure Load Balancer, the number of probes is being retired um, September 2027. Just use the probe threshold property instead. And now if I have a network virtual appliance, remember a network virtual appliance is really a virtual machine that's pre-configured with certain software that performs some network capability. Well, now if the traffic that's passing through it 
is going to a private endpoint, I can disable source network address translation. So that might be really useful in certain circumstances, maybe where I need to ensure I have some symmetric routing, i.e. the path the data comes in from the source to the destination, that path is the same as it travels back. That's really useful if I have like a stateful firewall, which needs to ensure it sees um, both of the flows of the traffic. Maybe I just need better insight into the actual the traffic and what's happening with it. So now it's an option. It's just a service tag I either add on the virtual machine NIC or on the VM instance if it's part of a virtual machine scale set. On the storage side, so the maximum storage account egress has been increased to 200 gigabits per second. So that's for commercial China and gov clouds. That's up from 120 gigabits per second. And it's for existing and new storage accounts. You don't need to do anything. You're just going to see that uh, default egress amount goes up. Database side. So the Azure SQL database serverless has lowered the duration that I can configure for the auto pause. So remember, the whole point of serverless is it can scale down to zero. I, I can stop paying for the compute element of it. And remember that free database offer we just saw was serverless. When it's gone down from one hour to 15 minutes. So I can configure that when I create my new databases or I can change the configuration of my existing. So it will just go into that auto pause that much faster. And again, it can auto start as well. Cosmos DB Data Explorer has a couple of new abilities that are in GA. So one of them is I can now have this custom column selector. So I can pick the specific columns that I care about the most to just make my overall experience better. But now also when I apply filters, well, I have a filter history. So if I've applied a certain set of filters to see the data I want, at a later time, I can go back and through the filter history, go and select that again, and I'm that much faster and efficient. MySQL Flexible now has flexible maintenance in GA. And the big part here is obviously there's maintenance that occurs, and I get notification of that maintenance. So what I can now do is I can actually reschedule the maintenance. So there's a certain maintenance ID I get told about in my service health alerts, and I can reschedule it. And now it's in GA, it's actually up to 30 days, I can push that back. It was 14 days during the preview. So I get the notification, there's maintenance coming, I say, no, no, that's not convenient for me. I want to do the maintenance at this time on this date, as long as it's within 30 days, you're good to go. Uh, I do that through the CLI today. And don't forget, I can still set actual maintenance windows for my instances through the portal, through CLI, so I can proactively configure when I want those things to normally happen. Cosmos DB dedicated gateway now has role-based access control support. There's actually a few things here. So ordinarily we use the primary key of the database to authenticate to that dedicated gateway, which means we don't get any granular controls. Now it's Entra integrated. So I can use an Entra account that could be a managed identity, for example. And then additionally, I can configure the specific operations I want it to be able to perform. Now there are no uh, dedicated gateway specific permissions. It's just mapping to the database operations. So I can say, hey, I wanna be able to create an item. I wanna be able to read an item. And so now I have that more granularity and I don't have to use that primary key. But additionally, one of the things I can also do is when I have this dedicated gateway, it has an integrated cache and that's a finite size. And there's gonna be certain operations I know I'm performing as the writer of the application I don't want to hit the cache. I don't want the data to be stored in the cache. I want to maximize its use for other things. So what I can now do is in the request options that I pass, there's a bypass integrated cache. And I just set it to true. And then, hey, that stuff will bypass the cache and go straight through. Redis 7.2 is now available on Azure Cache for Redis Enterprise. It's just going to automatically be updated. There are some new commands. There are performance enhancements there. PostgreSQL Flexible now has a disk ANN indexing. And that's in preview. Now remember, this is all about uh, vectors. 
And it's all about natural language type interactions where one word can mean many different things, many words can mean the same thing. So traditional lexical, i.e. keyword matches, don't work very well. And so we like vectors that are these huge dimensional arrays that represent the semantic meaning of data, that represent the semantic meaning of the thing I'm trying to search for. And then it could do this nearest neighbor to find the vectors that are the closest, which means they have the closest semantic meaning. So what disk ANN does is it's the same one used by Bing, uh, by Microsoft 365. It has a higher accuracy, a higher performance compared to the existing types of vector capabilities we see in PG Vector. So that is now available to use and that will help with your natural language, your generative AI searches to go and do that retrieval augmented generation. And then PostgreSQL anonymizer extension support is in previews. This, this is the Anon extension 1.3.2. And it's basically where I have sensitive data, I can protect that sensitive data. For example, performing masking, so I, I don't just go and see that. Also database, so Cosmos DB vCore MongoDB multi-shard clusters are in preview. So sharding, remember, is where we break up uh, the database into shards, parts, that I can then distribute over multiple servers. So the big deal, what that really means is it makes me able to have bigger databases and higher performance because I'm now distributing the data over instances and I'm distributing the queries over those instances. So this now lets me host larger workloads because I think I can have up to five shards. Every shard has the same configuration, the same number of vCores, same amount of memory, same storage, IOPS capacity, but that's now available. And then continuing on from that, I can do cross-region replication for those multi-shards. Now, what I would do here is I would create a replica cluster in my other region, and I can use it for different purposes. Now, obviously the obvious one is DR. So I could switch them and then that replica becomes the read write and then that original one would become read only. So I'm, I'm switching the roles. But maybe, or in addition to, I have a workload in the other region that just needs read access. So I'll go and read that replica in the same region. I'll reduce the latency and just make it more efficient. And I'm obviously taking that work off of the read write instance so it can focus on read writey things. That's a technical term, read writey things. Uh, Cosmos DB vCore MongoDB is now up to 32 terabytes of storage as well. So I can choose from eight, 16, 32 terabytes and they have appropriate IOPS, so 16,000, 18,000, 20,000 IOPS respectively. So now I can just have bigger databases. And obviously again, if I combine that with sharding, well, I could now be greater than 100 uh, terabytes in total. PostgreSQL now has exposed a number of performance parameters in GA. So for example, I could think about the maximum number of parallel apply uh, workers per subscription. There's a bunch of other things though, like temp file limits, logical decoding, work memory, idle session timeouts, uh, enable incremental sort, log host name. So I can configure. That's one of the nice things about flexible is you get far more access to a whole bunch of the configurable parameters. SQL Server 2022 and SQL Managed Instance now have this online disaster recovery in GA. So I can establish a two-way failover, failback relationship. So I could use, for example, an Azure SQL MI as my DR solution for an on-premise or in another cloud, my SQL Server 2022, and then I can always fail back. But I can also create a link from a SQL MI to a SQL Server 2022, which would then make it really easy, to, for example, to online copy the database to a SQL Server 2022 instance, maybe for dev test, maybe for some regulatory purpose, but it now makes it way, way easier to do that. On the miscellaneous, uh, the older EA price sheet using the billing account API, basically you need to migrate to 2023 11.01 API version, um, and use the enhanced price sheets. And don't forget that phase one of the MFA requirement is rolling out to tenants um, 15th of October. So in the next few days, at Azure portal, the Entra admin center, the Intune admin center, 
you're going to require MFA to access the portals. Remember, this does not mean, hey, I need to use MFA if I'm accessing an app that happens to be hosted on Azure. That's not what this is. It's when I'm interacting with those portals. So that's the phase one. Then in 2025, the phase two will then also add that MFA requirements to things like the Azure CLI, the Azure PowerShell, Azure Mobile Apps, um, if I'm using infrastructure as code to deploy, those types of things as well. And again, it doesn't apply to service principles. So if I'm using the proper things for my automation, this doesn't impact the service principles, doesn't impact managed identities or anything like that. And I did a whole video about this before. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Have an awesome weekend. Till next video, take care.